Hello everyone, welcome to Remedy OMM. Today we'll be going over some fundamental concepts. We will go over basics of the spine as well as Friette's principles. We have some good examples at the end to help cement these topics and in the next video we will go over some board style questions so let's dive right in. Here's an outline of what I'll be covering today. Our goals are to understand vertebral anatomy and some high yield landmarks. We will also go over vertebral motion and how that motion relates to Friette's principles. Of course, the components of the spine are the vertebra. And for OMM and for the boards, there's really two components you need to know. These are the transverse process and the spinous process. Know them and where they are in relation to the vertebral body. When you are examining a patient and palpating their spine, these are the two landmarks that you are trying to look for. You will use the spinous process to know what level you are at, and you will use the transverse process to determine any somatic dysfunctions the patient may have. This is definitely a more low yield topic. I've seen maybe less than five questions ever dealing with this, but the idea here is that this portion of the vertebra that connects to the one above is called a facet. And in varying regions of the spine, you will find that facets face in different directions. The mnemonic here is bum, bull, bum. It's supposed to kind of sound like bumblebee. But anyway, very simply, the cervical segments face backwards, up, and medial. The thoracic face backwards, up, and lateral, and the lumbar face backwards and medial. Again, super low yield, just something to know. On another note, this is high yield. You have to know your landmarks. Every test has at least one question where you have to know a landmark and which vertebral level it represents. It's very easy to memorize. Very simply, the suprasternal notch represents T2. T4 is represented by the nipple, T10 by the umbilicus. T3 represents the spine of the scapula, the inferior angle of the scapula represents T7, and the iliac crest is represented by L4. You have to know these. Now we are finally getting to the good stuff, the bread and butter of OMM. When it comes to the spine, a vertebra can have three basic movements. The first is positioning. A vertebra can be in a neutral position or it can be in a flex slash extended position. A vertebra can also be rotated, that is left or right. The last movement is side bending, also known as lateral rotation. This also occurs left to right. We'll get into some examples at the end of this lecture, but first I wanna give you some visuals of these positions. The first motion I wanna talk about is rotation. This is the most useful and easiest component to understand. Now, when you are examining a patient and palpating their spine, you are going to use the spinous process to determine what level you are at. For example, L3 or L4, or are you at T7 or T8? And with your thumbs, you're going to press in laterally to the spinal process and feel for a difference in how deep your thumbs can press. For example, if we look at the rotated left vertebra, we will see that when we palpate for the spinous process, our thumb will hit the left transverse process well before it hits the right. And you can actually feel this on a patient that has a somatic dysfunction. This tells you that the vertebra is rotated to the left. And in a test question, they will tell you something like, the left transverse process of T5 is more posterior than the right. That's your clue that the vertebra you are dealing with is rotated to the left. And with that information, you're about halfway to knowing the somatic dysfunction at that level. Once you figure out the rotation component, you are going to want to figure out the positioning. And here you will see a neutral, flex, and extended vertebra. Now you can't tell what position a vertebra is in based on palpation without understanding the other movement components and Friant's principles, which we will go into next. But on a test, they will tell you that the rotation component becomes more symmetric or asymmetric with flexion or extension. When we are naming a somatic dysfunction, we have to understand that we name somatic dysfunctions for the direction a patient wants to go in. That is super high yield. I'll say that again. We name somatic dysfunctions for the direction a patient wants to go in. So if we are rotated left and the asymmetry in the transverse processes get worse with flexion, then that's not the direction the patient wants to go. And we can say that the patient is extended. And the same goes for the opposite. If an asymmetry gets better in flexion, for example, then we can say the patient is flexed. That may be confusing, but it'll make more sense when we get to the examples. And this is the last component of vertebral motion, side bending, also known as lateral rotation, which also occurs left or right. This component we will figure out after the other two are figured out, and we will use Friette's principles to determine this. 
So what are Friet's principles? These are basically categories or rules in which vertebral motion fall, and they apply to the thoracic and lumbar spines only. And there's only two that you need to know. The first are what we classify as type 1 somatic dysfunctions. When a vertebra is found to be in a neutral position, we know that the rotation and side bending components are in opposite directions. So for example, if L4 is found to be neutral and rotated left, then we know that it's side bent right because it's in the opposite direction. These type 1 dysfunctions tend to be group dysfunctions. The second category is type 2 dysfunctions. When a vertebra is found to be either flexed or extended, then we know that rotation and side bending components are in the same direction. The way I like to remember this is by telling myself type 1, one of each, type 2, two of the same. So if a vertebra is flexed or extended and rotation is to the right, then side bending must also be to the right. Type 1, one of each, type 2, two of the same. Now let's look at some examples so we can put it all together. Example number one, name the somatic dysfunction below. So we are given L4 and some images. Pop quiz, which landmark represents L4? I'll give you a second. That's right, it's the iliac crests. Make sure to know your landmarks. I'll give you a second to figure out the dysfunction below. Okay, so now we look at the first image. We have a vertebra that is dipped forward, which means this person is flexed. Next, we have a vertebra that is turned to the left, so we can say that it is rotated left. And again, you can see here that if our thumbs were palpating from the back, we would find that the left transverse process is more posterior than the right, also telling us that we are rotated to the left. And lastly, we can see the side bending component, and it is dipping to the left, which means we are side bent left. So all together, we can say that we have an L4 that is flexed, rotated left, and side bent left. And we have shorthand that as L4, F for flexed, RL for rotated left, and SL for side bent left. And we can see here that this is a type 2 somatic dysfunction. So we said we are flexed, and we have rotation and side bending occurring on the same side. Just to look at it one more time, we are flexed, so that means we're type 2, and we have rotation and side bending occurring on the same side. Remember, type 2, 2 of the same. Okay, that was easy. Next example. Again, name the somatic dysfunction below, and again, we have L4. I'll give you guys a second to see if we can figure this out. Now, you may have been fooled by this one thinking you weren't given enough information, but let's work through it. Looking at the first image, it doesn't seem like we're dipped forward, nor are we pulled back, which means we must be in a neutral position. Next, the rotation component. Okay, well, same as last time. We're turned to the left, and the left transverse process is more posterior than the right, so we are rotated left. Now, what about side bending? Which direction are we side bent? Well, what do we know? We know that we are neutral, which means that we must follow type 1 Friet's principles. Type 1 means one of each. So if we are rotated left, then we must be side bent right. And we are. And we shorthand that as L4 and RL for rotated left and SR for side bent right. Remember, type 1, one of each. Type 2, two of the same. Now before the next example, I need to restate this point because it is very important. We name somatic dysfunctions for the direction the patient wants to go. We name them for the direction of ease, the direction that makes the patient feel better or less restricted. Okay, with that out of the way, let's look at the next example. Okay, so it looks like this time we aren't given any images, but instead we're given two lines of clues. So let's imagine we are palpating a patient and this is what we find. Let's look at the first line. First line says that the right transverse process is more posterior than the left. So imagine what that looks like in your head. If the right transverse process is more posterior than the left, then we are talking about our rotation component and the vertebra must look like this. So we are rotated to the right. Okay, let's look at the second line. It states that the findings in line one become more asymmetrical or worse with flexion. Okay, so if the rotation component becomes worse with flexion, then that, the, that must mean that the patient prefers the opposite direction. And remember, we name somatic dysfunctions for the direction the patient wants to go. So therefore, this patient must be extended. 
And now that we know that we are extended and that this vertebra is in the lumbar spine, meaning we follow Friet's principles, extension means type 2 somatic dysfunction, type 2, two of the same. So therefore, if we are extended and rotated right, then we must also be side bent right as well. And we are. And we shorthand that like this. A lot of test questions will resemble this example right here. So make sure you understand it. Okay guys, that's all I have for you today. So here's the high yield takeaways from this lecture. First of all, know your landmarks. T4 and T10 tend to be the most high yield. Secondly, know your Friet's principles. Type 1 are neutral dysfunctions where rotation and side bending are occurring in opposite directions. And then type 2, flexion or extension, rotation and side bending occur in the same direction. And lastly, we name somatic dysfunctions for the direction of ease, the direction the patient wants to go. Thank you guys for tuning in. Please like, comment, subscribe. In the next lecture, we'll go over some board style questions that covers these topics. They'll help you guys a lot. Take care.